Meanwhile, at Edirne, a new young Turkish sultan, Mehmet, had taken up the Ottoman throne. At Constantinople, the new emperor, John's brother, Constantine, soon discovered that he now had a dangerous and most impatient neighbor. In April 1452, there was a huge row at the court of Sultan Mehmet II. Byzantine ambassadors had turned up complaining that the young man was breaking all his father's treaties. He was too. He was building a huge castle right next door to Constantinople called the Cutthroat. It was the first stages in his planned attack upon the city. And now, in his reply to these ambassadors, he tried to scare the pants on. Listen to this. These are his very words. Have you the right or the power to control my actions on my own territory? Inform your king that I am very different from my father, that my resolution surpasses all my ancestors. This time, you can return in safety, but the next man who delivers a similar message to me will be flayed alive. Back in Constantinople, the new emperor, Constantine XI, reluctantly composed his reply. It is clear, he said to the Sultan, that you desire war more than peace. So let that be your desire. I release you from all your oaths and treaties with me, and in closing the gates of my city, I tell you I will defend my people to the last drop of blood. The Turkish mosques in Byzantium were shut. The Turkish troops who were sightseeing in the city were thrown out the gates. Byzantium was at war. Mehmet was actually very touched by Constantine. After all, the Ottomans and Byzantines had lived side by side for a very long time. They'd fought together in wars, they'd intermarried. But Mehmet was also very determined. Listen to his reply. I shall take your city, he tells Constantine, or the city will take me. If, however, you admit defeat and withdraw, I will give you Mistra and its province, and we shall be friends. If you deny me peaceful entry, however, I shall slay you and all your nobles. I shall slaughter the inhabitants of your city and allow my troops to plunder it. The city itself is all I want, even if it is empty. Constantine's reply was brief. You may have anything you want of me other than the city. I will not flee from it, nor will I evacuate. You may have anything but the city. For the city, I would rather die than live. On the evening of the 28th, the Sultan Mehmet addressed his armies standing assembled outside the city walls. I give you, he said, the capital of the ancient Romans, the summit of power and glory, the center of the world. I give over to you the men, women, and children of this city. It's gold and silver, it's silks and furs. All I want are the buildings and the walls. It really was the standard offer of a medieval commander to his troops before the final assault. And they roared in agreement. There is but one God, they said, and Muhammad is his prophet. On the fringe of empire, high in the mountains of northern Romania, contemporary Byzantine artists made precious records of the fall of Constantinople. Here's the Turkish armies, waiting for Mehmet to order the final assault upon the city. The cannons, large as dragons, it was said, brought down from Edirne to pulverize the city's vast old walls. The Turkish navy, fighting all along the Golden Horn, forcing the tiny armies of the Byzantines to fight on two fronts at once. 
On the city walls, the Byzantines parade the holy icon of the Virgin, the city's sacred shield, just as they had done for a thousand years and more. Every hole, each crack and weakness in the ancient walls is strengthened by the prayers of priests, the women and the children. There's the emperor, ordering the walls repair with rocks and stones. And the empress too, with her ladies. Here though, the artist is in error. There was no queen. Constantine XI, Constantine of Mistra, was childless and a widower. The last emperor would leave no heir. On the last day of Byzantium, an eerie quiet fell over the city. Mehmet had told the Turks to rest for a whole day before the last assault. He gave the emperor time to walk with all that was left of the armies and nobles of Byzantium once again into the great church. And there, after all their arguing at Florence, the Greeks and the Latins joined together in a last service and the emperor went to the altar and was given the last rites. Then he walked back to the palace and there he made a speech to his commanders. A speech, you might say, that was the last speech of the ancient world. He encouraged them not to be frightened when the Turks attacked. He said that their ancestors, the ancient Romans, were terrified when Hannibal's elephants had charged towards them. That they hadn't run away. Because they were human beings, people with will and mind, and not given to animal desires, and that he and his commanders had mind and will and God and belief upon their side. It was those beliefs of mind that stem back to Greece and Rome and fuel the modern world. And then Constantine, the eleventh of that name, went with his men back to the outskirts of his empire, to the walls now of his city. And there he died, the ruler of Rome, the king of Christendom and the emperor of Byzantium. What actually happened to him is a mystery. Turkish historians tell us only that the emperor was very brave. The Constantine died fighting by the city gates. The city is taken, he's supposed to have cried, and I'm still alive. And he ran off towards the battle and into the flash of legend. The man then killed ten pashas and sixty soldiers with his lance, and at the end, poor Constantine was toppled from his horse and cried to God Almighty, the creator of the universe. And the Turks cut off his head and stuck it on a pole. As he rode through the streets of Constantinople on the first day of the Turkish conquest, Sultan Mehmet found whole districts of the sacred city derelict and abandoned, saw hovels and graveyards built amongst the ruins of its legendary palaces. He was awed, though, by the Imperial Church of St. Sophia, and declared its venerable shell to be a building made for God. So the Church of Saint Sophia, the Church of the Divine Wisdom, was converted to the Mosque of Aya Sophia, the Mosque of the Divine Wisdom. Images of old Byzantium had glimmered at the edge of Asia for a thousand years. Now new ghosts, new legends and new peoples came to haunt its fabled stones. Legend tells that Mehmed rode into Saint Sophia on his war horse and placed his finger in this magic column and spun the church around to face Mecca for the call to prayer. History tells 
that the Sultan ordered the tomb of Constantine the Great, the founder of Byzantium, to be demolished, along with the burial church of the ancient emperors, and this great mosque, the funerary mosque of Mehmet the Conqueror, was put up in its place. Yet Mehmet, a humane and sympathetic man, still wondered at this ancient ruined city and its unyielding inhabitants. The most eminent Byzantine left alive inside the city was Gennadius, the theologian. Mehmet visited him here, in the monastery of Christ Pantocrator. Who were the people of this crumbling ancient city, the Sultan asked him, and what exactly was their faith? Like most of the inhabitants of this most stubborn city, Gennadius would only answer for himself. You may not call me a Greek, he said, because I do not believe as those ancient pagan people once believed. You might call me a Byzantine, because I was born in this city, but I prefer simply to call myself a Christian. He might also have added that he considered himself to be an exclusive member, a leading light of the society that was God's kingdom on this earth. Mehmet was pleased enough with the old boy's answer to give the penniless church a bag of gold make Gennadius its leader, to give him a white mule, and to give him authority too over all the Christians of his empire. It was an arrangement that lasted for four centuries. As for Gennadius' beloved monastery, well, its church became a madrasa, an Islamic public school, and one Zarek became a very famous preacher in this city. Now, when Mehmet first came to the church, his quick eye had noticed a great line of stone sarcophagi along the aisle there. In fact, they were the tombs, the sarcophagi, of the last kings of Byzantium. John of Florence was buried here, his brother, their queens. These he took for his new palace in the city. He also took a slab of stone laid in that trench over there. For centuries, pilgrims have believed that that had been the very slab of stone on which the body of the Lord Jesus Christ had laid after the crucifixion. They said you could still see Mary's tears upon it, glistening like pearls.